my class. Uh, how many of you have only been in my class less than a year? All right, so that's it. Uh, on tomorrow's Valentine's Day, you know, and all of you, except for Dick and his wife, have been my Valentine's today, and I'll have to take care of that right now. Oh, thank you. Yeah. <coughs> Just barely had enough tonight. Tomorrow is Valentine's Day. Well, where in the world did Valentine's, the, the story of Valentine's, come from? There was a man, a preacher, in Rome by the name of Valentino. Valentino. And he was... Uh, a minister there. They were all Baptists, by the way. There wasn't anything else but Baptists in this period of time in history. They were all Baptists. Anyway, he uh, he was the uh, one of the ministers there during Claudius II's time, a Roman emperor. Claudius II was going around conquering to conquer, as they usually did back in those days. You know, the favorite pastime of kings and emperors were uh, getting people killed off in your armies. Well, he couldn't get enough people to join his army. So he decided that the reason why the men aren't joining the army is because they're married, or they're wanting to get married. So well, he said, I'm going to outlaw uh, marriage. It's all right if they live with a woman for a while, but uh, they can't get married. Amen. All right, they couldn't get married. So he outlawed marriage. Now, you have to remember, you have to think about this for a minute also, because there was no such thing as marriage licenses as that time, okay? There were no such things as real, actually legal marriages at that time. These were all Baptists back then. But that what they would do is when two people showed their affection toward one another, they would get up in front of the church and they would make their announcement that they were going to become man and wife. And uh, the minister would uh, ask God's blessing upon that union and send them off. Well, uh, uh, Claudius II uh, forbid any minister to perform a, uh, what we call a uh, uh, blessing any marriages between people. He said it's going to be against the law now. All right? Well, he kept on doing it anyway. And he was arrested and uh, put in jail. And his sentence uh, was that he would be beaten till he was unconscious and then he would be beheaded. That was the, for this crime, that's what he was going to do. They, they were going to beat him until he become unconscious, and then they were going to behead him. And he was in jail for quite a while, and they'd ask him to renounce his faith and, uh, and tell that he wouldn't do this because everybody liked Valentino. All right? Well, while he was in jail, there was a guy there, a jailer by the name Asterius. Asterius. And he had a blind daughter. And he would bring uh, his daughter to jail with him, and uh, Valentino would read to her scriptures and tell her about God. And Asterius was saved, and he became a convert during his time in jail. You know, God even uses the bad things in life to, to bring about something. I said here a while back when I got some poison so badly and near death, I said, God must have allowed it for some reason, or else it wouldn't have happened. Had to be good for something. <laughs> well, anyway, Valentino was in jail. And this girl was blind. And uh, he prayed that God would open her eyes, and God did, and she could see. And uh, she just loved him. She loved this preacher. And when it came time for him to be executed on February the 14th, 269 A.D., all churches at that time were Baptist churches, all right, at, at this period of time in history. He left a note in his jail cell for her, and it says, uh, love from your Valentine, Valentino. And that's where they say that the Valentine cards come from. Now, 
Val Valerius or Valeri uh, means uh, worthy. That's what his name means, worthy. Now, through history, way before Valentino or Valentine, there was uh, this period of time in the middle of, of February every year, the Roman Empire um, would have a uh, festival. And it was in honor of Juno, or the queen of the Roman gods and goddesses. The Romans, uh, goddess of marriage and making up. The following day, February 15th, began the feast of Luper. Calia, Lupercalia. And what they would do is the young people were forbidden to see each other. Boys and girls didn't mix. But on this day, they would have a big bowl and they would write somebody's name on it. And they would take that name and they would draw it out. And for at least during this festival, this guy, when he draw this girl's name, that would be his Valentine, so to speak, during this this festival and uh, of Lupercalia. And sometimes they would get married in the end. Sometimes later on they would get married. They would uh, fall in love and get married. Claudius, of course, had called all of this off and everything else during this period of time. The, uh, the history of this goes all the way back to Great Britain, England, Wales. In Wales, wooden love spoons were carved and given as gifts on February the 14th. Hearts, keys, and keyholes were favorite decorations on the spoons. The decoration meant, you unlock my heart. Okay, you unlock my heart. In the Middle Ages, young men and women drew names from a bowl to see who their valentines would be. They would wear their names on their sleeves. All right? And that's why you get the old saying is that uh, your heart, you wear your heart on your sleeves. Openly they knew who they cared for and loved Bill. Now, why did, why did Claudius stop the marriages at Jim Jim? Because he wanted people in his army. He figured if they didn't get married, if they only could just lay up with some woman for a while, uh, they, he didn't stop that, but he stopped commitments and marriages, okay? <coughs> then... Uh, in some countries, young woman would receive a gift of clothing from a young man. If she kept the gift, it means that she would marry him. Some people used to believe that if a woman saw a robin flying overhead on Valentine's Day, it meant that she would marry a sailor. These are old sayings. And if she saw a sparrow, she would marry a poor man and be very happy. If she saw a goldfinch, she would marry a millionaire or a very rich man. A love seat. How many of you ever heard? Have you got a love seat? Anybody have a love seat at home? Okay, love seats were actually used to be like an S, it's like this. Okay? Like an S. And the boy and the girl would sit there, not too close, but they would sit there. The Amish even had a, uh, a courting bed, a bunting bed. They worked so hard that they would take prospective girls and boys and they would let them sleep together. But they had a petition between them. They could sit there and talk all night long in bed and visit. Now, young girls used to take and uh, pick five or six names of boys or girls that they might marry and they twist the stem of an apple and recite the names until the stem comes off and the name that you were saying when the stem came off is the one that you're going to marry. And then you take a, uh, a flower like a sunflower, and you'd pull it. He loves me, he loves me not. He loves me, he loves me not. He loves me, he loves me not. And the one that you had your heart set upon, if he loves me not or he loved me, when the last one was pulled off, that's what he was being. All right? A dandelion. You'd pick a dandelion and blow on the dandelion real hard, and uh, how many of uh, those little seeds were left on that dandelion was how many children you would have. These are all little things that people used to do at Valentine's. They'd cut an apple open. And that's how many seeds you saw when you cut the apple open, that's how many children you would have. How many of you ever heard of Cupid? He was a, these were little Roman gods and Greek gods, and, and they would be flying. This, this little 
Cupid guy. He would hear a bow and an arrow shooting, and he would wear a diaper and fly around with little wings like an angel. Okay? These are all things of Valentine. The uh, Christian world, actually the Catholic Church, this pagan holiday was so disgusting to them, where these young people would get together and everything else, that they thought they would make a saint out of Valentine, or Valentino, and that they would do away with uh, this pagan festival and call it Valentine's Day. So there is where you have the history of Valentine's Day. I hope you enjoyed that. 2 at 12 and verse 5. Now we get into gifts. Now we get into gifts. We talked about uh, the spirit world last week. The spirit world is never going to be dropped as a subject during all of this because in the spirit world uh, is also a lot of fakery and also a uh, facade. With the gifts came also Satan confusing people. That uh, little booklet that you have out there, that near cult there, that is, a, that is my master's, master's thesis that I wrote when I was in college. And I came from the charismatic group. That's where I was saved. When I was saved, when I was young, I was saved in the charismatic church. It wasn't their fault. <laughs> the Spirit of God was convicting my soul of sin, righteousness, and judgment to come. My grandmother had just gotten killed. That was my mother, so to speak. And I was left in the world all alone. And uh, God had been dealing with me. And not only had he been dealing with me, but I believe that he was calling me to preach even at that young hour in my life. And I didn't know what to do. I would see, get a, see a preacher get up and preach. And, of course, the thing was very emotional. And uh, many times he didn't even get to preach the whole sermon before everything went into chaos. But the day that I was saved, I remember I went down to the altar. I just walked down to the altar during the middle of the service. Because I wanted to be saved that day. And followed behind me was my former step-grandmother. And she walked down there and she said, Jimmy, what? why are you down here? And I said, I want to be saved, but I don't know how to be saved. And so she said, well, you need to ask God to forgive you of your sins and ask him to cleanse your soul and give your life to him. Well, I did that. And I really, there was a change in my life at that time, and there was a peace that I didn't have before. But boy, I didn't have any spiritual foundation there at all. There just wasn't any. It was just emotion, all emotion all emotion. Well, when I went to, uh, to the seminary, they said, uh, uh, when we were, I wrote my bachelor's thesis on this thing, and I just wrote a very basic thing about the gifts, and from the original language and everything else, they said, no, we want you to go study and do some background research and do all kinds of stuff, so some fake healing and all this kind of stuff in there, okay? Well, I did, and now I wish I could cut it back down like it was originally because <laughs> I don't really care about the other thing. It doesn't really matter. But what has been so foundational in many, many churches all over the world is what I did on the gifts, what the gifts really are. Okay? Now, 12 and verse 5, <coughs> Kai, the Areses, the Aconion, Asen, Kai, Ho, Autos, Kyrios. And there is a dividing, a distributing of uh, commissions, works, duties, servants, services. It, it is each and every one of them. And the same Lord. Now, the same Lord is over all of this. Rebecca, do you have your little deal there open? Would you mind coming up here and reading that for me, this first verse here? Actually, you can probably go and read all the way from uh, 1 all the way down to number 5, where we are right now. That will give us a, a little bit of a, uh, a background. Now, about the spiritual gifts, the special endowments of the supernatural energy, brethren, I do not want you to be misinformed. 
You know that when you were heathen, you were led off after idols in, that could not speak habitually as impulse directed and whenever the occasion might arise. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking under the power and influence of the Holy Spirit of God can ever say, Jesus be cursed. And no one can really say, Jesus is my Lord, except by and under the power and influence of the Holy Spirit. Now, there are distinctive varieties and distributions of endowments, gifts, extraordinary powers, distinguish, distinguishing certain Christians due to the power of divine grace operating in their souls by the Holy Spirit. And they vary, but the Holy Spirit remains the same. And there are distinctive varieties of service and administration, but it is the same Lord who is served. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Last week we looked and we talked about uh, the spirit world. We talked about the war in the spirit world. We talked about uh, uh, how no one could, at that period of time, if you said Jesus is Lord, it would cost you your life. And nobody's going to say Jesus is Lord and put your head on the chopping block unless you've been saved. That's simply what it means. In short, I spent a lot of time last week saying this. Okay? Now, there were different kinds of, uh, of services in a church, aren't there? There are, there are offices in church, aren't there? Let's name some of the offices in a church today. Deacons. Okay, deacons. Pastors. And what? Pastors and deacons. Amen. And what? Amen. That's everybody else. Yeah, the laos, that laos means people, layman, laos people. Uh, what else? What are some of the, the things Treasure. in churches? What? Treasure. Treasures and clerk or secretary and teachers. All right, and teachers. And even missionaries go out today. Even missionaries go out today. These are the services that we want, okay, that we look at. And uh, he's naming each and every one. Uh, Romans 11 and verse 13, Luke and 10 and 4, 1 Corinthians 16 and 15, and 2 Corinthians 8 and 4 are cross reference to this. Martha played a part in that early church, didn't she? All right. What did Mary do? Sat at the, at the Lord's feet, didn't she? All right. So she was soaking it up. All right. Martha was a servant. She was a... Uh, uh, she really wasn't a deaconess, but she was a servant, so to speak, in a church. All right? They had uh, people that would go around with a collection. 1 Corinthians 16 and verse 15. And 2 Corinthians 8 and 4. These are the ones that uh, took up the collection. These are some of the gifts in the church. 12 and verse 6 now. Chi, the Ereses. And there, gay maton. Asen, ho, day, altos, theos, ho, and there gone, ta, pata, in, pasen. And dividing, distributing of operations, energizing. This means to perform, to operate. It means to uh, affect the thing wrought. This word means to energize. That are energizing, okay, energizing. Now today, we have three church gifts left. Three church gifts left. What are those three gifts? Well, we haven't got, we're kind of jumping ahead, but what are the three gifts we have today? Faith, hope, and love. Pastors is not a gift. That's calling. It's not a gift. Apostles don't exist anymore. Nobody's walked and talked with the Lord, have they? Now, the Catholic Church just had their Pope, their Holy See, uh, resign. The first one to resign in 600 years. To the Catholic Church, he is an apostle. The Mormons, they have apostles. But the apostles of the Bible lived in that day, and they had seen the Lord. That was They had to have John's baptism, and they had to have seen and be ministered to the, to the ministry, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That was what an apostle was. Okay? And these early churches had powers. Before the Bible was completed, they had great miraculous powers. A person didn't have to study to preach a, to preach a message. When you got up, God told them the message. It was inspired. Okay? Inspired. 
the letters of the New Testament and the four Gospels of the New Testament did not have in most churches at that time. These were being written. The book of Revelation was written about what year? The last book of the Bible. What year was it written, do you know? What? A little further than that. It was in the 90, almost 100 A.D. John was old. John lived to be about 100, almost 140 years old. Did you know that? He died in Ephesus. He was the pastor there. They carried him to church on a stretcher. First, second, and third John that was written. And then the book of Revelation. He was uh, in exile when he wrote the book of Revelation. His most famous words are children love one another. That's about the, That was the message that he preached there at last. Children love one another. By the way, Mary probably died at Ephesus, by the way, because John took care of her. He, Jesus gave his uh, a guardianship of his mother over to John, and John took her to Ephesus. And that's where he, she probably died in Ephesus. Many histories say that she died in Ephesus. She wasn't taken up to heaven, <laughs> as the Catholic Church says. The holy capture of her and taken up of her. All right. And the difference of operations energizing, there are, each and every one of these are, but the same God. And the one energizing, look at that, nominee, singular, masculine, present, participle, active. The things all and in all. All right. 12 and verse 7. He hekaso de derote he phonerosis tu numatos pros to simferon and are moreover that little weak adversative conjunction how it starts off the second word in that verse and to each one is given third person singular present indicative passive you don't ask for this gift it is given to you God picks you out for this gift then then today I had a guy here walk the other day asked me, he said, do you think God's called me to preach? And I told him, I said, don't preach. If you can keep from preaching, don't preach. And I said, if you can keep from preaching, that means he's not calling you. <laughs> as simply as that. Because if God calls you to preach, you're going to preach. You're going to have to. And of course, if you're going to get up and say something, you've got to learn something. So you've got to study his word. If you're a person that is lazy and don't like and, and does not like to study, God is not going to call you to preach. As simple as that. Because preaching takes a lot of study and a lot of conviction and a lot of concentration and a lot of focus. If you cannot preach, God didn't call you. You are all my Valentines, all of you here tonight. I gave every one of you a little Valentine thing because I love it each and every one of you. And you are what I live for. Because God called me to preach, and I know that. I know that when I'm up here, that I'm right in the center of God's will for my life. Now, I don't know what he's got for you to do, but he's got something for you to do because he just doesn't leave us alone in this world. We are something. If it's nothing else than setting and holding down a chair, you have to play a service. All right. Over to each one is given the manifestation, the illumination, the display, and the sight to be inspected. That's what that word means, phonerosis. Now, we have to say when we're interpreting the Bible, what do we do when we're interpreting the Bible? When was the book of Corinthians written? Hmm? Go back and look in the very beginning and tell when it was written. You know? 55 A.D. All right. About 55 A.D. In 55 A.D., all the church gifts were still operating. They had very few books of the Bible at all. Period. Very few. Okay? Very few books of the Bible. Inspiration was absolutely necessary. Some churches during the Dark Ages would only have a few pages of of the New Testament because the Catholic Church tried to destroy the Word of God did their best 
to destroy the Word of God, but they stuck with it. There was a group <coughs> that went to Armenia and all the way into Europe that were called Paulicians. Paulicians. Say Paulicians. Paulicians. Because they had all the writings of Paul. All of them. And they were called Paulicians because they studied and preached the writings of Paul in their church. Not many people had all of the writings of Paul. There was a guy by the name of Constantine. That was his name that he took. And he was a, a Christian and he was running from the Catholic Church. And this was about, uh, I think, about 600 A.D. And the Catholic Church was becoming very strong. And that they forbid the Baptists to preach the Word of God. Well, he went over there in Armenia, and he had the whole Bible with him. The whole Bible. All of it. And he stayed, and somebody took care of him for like two or three years and hit him out. And he was preaching to them, and all this time he copied all the Scriptures. By the way, they, they had the Scriptures in Greek. What you're studying tonight, that's what Baptists preached in for a thousand, more than a thousand years. Okay? He copied the whole Bible and gave it to this guy. And that guy called himself Constantine. Now, we're not talking about Constantine the Great in 345 A.D., the, the one that married the church with the state. That's the guy that started the persecution. Okay? Anyway, uh, they had all the Bible. And these churches were the soundest of all the churches. This is where the Waldenses came from. You ever heard of the Waldenses? How about Mennonites? This is where the Mennonites' origins all started back then. They were all Anabaptists. Again, is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the profiting, for the making better. That's the word seem federon. It means to bear together. It means to make profit, to make improvement, to make better. Bill. And my the way my Bible is interpreted that is that the, that the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. It, it, what, I, what it's telling me is if God gives you a, a, a gift, it's for the profit of everybody. You're to in that pay. church, in that church, God inspired you to say what you said because it was personal instruction because they didn't have anything else. They didn't have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and they didn't have 1 Corinthians at that time. Paul is writing this letter, and he's writing the letter to the Corinthian church because the Corinthian church had problems. They had lots of problems. Okay? And that's why this letter is written, and now he's telling them why that they had received these gifts because the devil had got involved in this church, and he had led them astray. Okay? And they were doing some very uh, bad things in the church. They were doing some very bad practices. And it was such a serious thing, as we read in some of the earlier chapters, what did God do to these people because they were perverting the gifts and even the Lord's Supper? What happened to them? What happened? Michelle? Some of them died. Some of them got sick. Some of them died. God kills some of them. Okay? 12 and verse 8 now. 12 and verse 8. Whole men gar dia to... Numatos, Didote, Logos, Sophios, Alo, De, Logos, Nosios, Tara, To, Alto, Numa. Now, in the last verse, I, I skipped over something, forgot to tell you. Many times in the verse before, many times when it's talking and describing the Spirit of God, the word Spirit, Numa, is what? In what gender is that? What gender, Rebecca? Okay. Okay, Bill? Yeah. What What gender is the word spirit, pneumatos? What is gender is that? What is that, Brother Mike? Huh? No. Brother Randall, he knows. Neuter. Thank you, Brother. You got A plus tonight. <coughs> it's neuter gender because the word spirit is a neuter word. Okay? Now, the Holy Spirit is a person, and he's masculine. The thus that describe the Holy Spirit will be masculine. And the personal pronouns will be masculine, but the word spirit has to be neuter because it is a neuter, neuter word. Okay? Simple as that. So I want you to do it. The, the, uh, <coughs> 
the Jehovah Witnesses say that the Holy Spirit is not does not exist. It is only a thing. He's only a thing. It's just a force. Okay. Well, he is a person, and his and that person, the Holy Spirit, is masculine. The Godhead is masculine. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's masculine. Okay. He does call himself Al Shaddai, though, doesn't he? The All Powerful One. And what does that? And he calls himself His presence, the Shekinah presence of God. And what kind of a word is Shekinah? Shekinah is feminine. All right. And El Shaddai, it, it comes from a woman's breast, how she nurses her children. And it means to provide and to care for and to guard. All powerful guardian. Okay. Sometimes a, a, a grizzly mama is very powerful. Okay. A grizzly mama is very powerful. Okay. God, we see God in his ways, in his actions. Every sacrifice in the Old Testament portrayed some work of Jesus Christ in his ministry, some fulfillment. Every Jehovah title in the Old Testament portrayed Christ in some work or aspect of his person. The Holy Spirit is a neuter word, but he is a person. 12 and verse 8. Back to 12 and 8. Which indeed for through are by the agency of the Spirit. Now look at that word too there. That's genitive singular masculine, but the word spirit again is genitive singular neuter. Okay? You got that? It is given. It is given. That's passive voice. Passive voice, we got a couple of teachers here. Uh, Rebecca, what is passive voice? Okay, it happens upon something happens to you. All right? When you're acting, you're acting. But when something is done to you, that's passive voice. All right, this is given to you. All right? A person is given this. He doesn't ask for it. He does not seek it. It is given to him. These Corinthians were seeking some of these things. We're going to find out later on. They weren't supposed to be seeking. They were zealously seeking these gifts. And the translation of it is very poor. All right? One is a spirit of the word is given of wisdom. To another, the word of knowledge. Wisdom and knowledge. When, uh, <clears throat> when that early church, when Judas Issachariot, what does Issachariot mean? Issachariot. Matt and from Cariol. Another A plus for today, Randall? You did, you're doing real good today. You're an honor student. All right. And what does uh, Judas, Judas mean? That's a real good name. Nobody names their child Judas anymore or in such a way, but they do. Rebecca, what does that mean? You know, Bill, you know what you do mean? You praise Jehovah, another A plus. <laughs> did you get? Did you tell him that, Corey? All right. Actually, Judas should be Judah, and people do name their children Judah today, but they don't call him Judas because the King James Version names this guy, this scoundrel, this uh, deceitful betrayer, this Judas. We use that word to describe somebody that's uh, dishonest. And betrays you. All right? Word of wisdom and a word of knowledge, according to the same spirit. To the same spirit. Look at that. To the same spirit. Dative, singular, neuter. To the same spirit. Talked about the gifts of the spirit in uh, 1 Timothy 4 and 1, and 1 John 4 and 1, and 1 Corinthians, the 10th chapter. 12 and verse 9, hetero, and that's with a rough breather, say hetero, pistis, en, to, alto, numati, alo, de, charismata, himaton, en, to, hina, numati. To another faith. <laughs> now, guess what? Since we have three gifts left in the church today, we got faith, don't we? How do you believe? How do you? How did you get saved, Brother Dick? By the Spirit drawing you. By the Spirit of God drawing you, and by the grace of God gave you the gift of faith and believing. Let's go to Ephesians two and eight in your mind. You don't have to go there. Uh, I, and I can't quote this in King James because I don't know it in King James. I only know it in Greek. Okay. 
It says, For it submersed in grace ye are having been saved. In grace, submersed in grace, ye are having been saved through faith. And that is not out of you. That faith is not out of you. That gift didn't come from you. It's all done upon you, passive force. You are having been saved. You don't save yourself. You don't do anything to get saved. You couldn't muster up enough belief to, to believe anything spiritually because our nature is a nature of Adam. Adam's nature. All right, Adam's nature. One another faith in the same spirit to another uh, gifts of cures. Look at that word cures, the acts of healing. All right. The acts of healing, like in Acts 4 and verse 30 in Luke 7 and 21. Acts of healing. Now, how would the public know? By the way, healing and miracles are never performed for people that believe. Not really. That wasn't the reason they were done. Why did Jesus do all the miracles that he did? Why did he do it? Why did he perform the miracles? Why did Jesus perform miracles? That was the messianic credentials. He had to identify who he was. He healed blind people. He healed blind people because only the Messiah would heal a blind person. Never before was anyone healed with blindness until Jesus came. All right? If that girl, that jailer's daughter, was actually blind, we have one case of blind people being healed later on and that was by Valentino there were other people that were healed miraculously Paul when he went into the Roman culture he healed people to prove who he was that he was an apostle he did these cures to prove who he was he didn't, make, he didn't do it to make people believe the person that he was healing it wasn't to make them believe when Jesus healed that blind man that had been blind all of his life, that person that he healed didn't even know who he was. Couldn't believe. Because <laughs> he didn't know who he was. He said, who, believe, who healed you? And he said, I don't know. I don't know who he was. They asked his parents, you know, the Messiah was going to heal the blind. And this man had been blind for like 38 years, I believe, or something like that. And the synagogue, uh, you know, those Pharisees and the county clerks, which were called what? Yeah, what? Well, the scribes. And every a scribe wrote down everything that happened in the area where synagogue was. Uh, he was a county clerk. He sealed every contract, everything. He would write it all down. The scribes and the Pharisees ran each synagogue. People would get up and volunteer in that area. They'd get up and read and everything else. But the Pharisees would run them, ring them out, boy. Every place, wherever they want. They uh, wanted to prove that Jesus wasn't the Messiah. They didn't want to believe. Because he was going to take their religion away from them and their nation away from them. And they didn't want that. They wanted to run the show themselves. And they had been running the show for a long time. One faith in the same spirit and another gifts of cures. Healings were proved for one thing. Now, does God heal people today? Yes. Do we have the gift of healing today? No. We don't have it. We can't lay hands on anybody and make them raise them today or anything else. That doesn't happen today. But do you pray for people that they will get well? I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for your prayers. Did you know that? I wouldn't be here wouldn't be here. If it wasn't for your prayers, it would not be here. Because Bill doesn't have his Bible yellowed out, he said. Yeah. Bill, I may outlive you. I outlived a whole lot of people. I don't, I don't know how I did it, but the Lord wasn't finished with me yet. That's all I can say. I will be here until he's finished with me. This might be the last sermon I ever preach. I don't know. But I'm going to do it for him. Yeah, that's where you are. <laughs> You don't have to worry. I don't ask God. So I can figure out my Bible's out. Cures. And the one spirit. Spirit of God is the one that does all of this. He does all of this. God heals people today. 
God does a lot of things today, miraculously today. Each and every time that he saves a lost sinner, that's a miracle. Every time that he takes a, he takes a sinner or a religious person that's in a false religious system, like in Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons, every time somebody is saved out of one of them religions, it is a miracle. Every time he saves a Catholic, it is a miracle. That's a miracle. I'm going to tell you because they're locked in in the other spiritual realm. Every time he saves one of those people, it is a miracle. That is a great miracle. <clears throat> now, here in the one spirit, uh, this word in here, in, see that preposition there, page 137, in to ina pneumati, in the one spirit, it is in contrast with words before, it was dia and kato in verse number 8, okay? 12 and verse 10 now, 12 and verse 10. Alo de energemata. Dinamion. Alo de is in brackets, but you kind of understood. Protatia. Alo de again. Diacrisis. Numaton. Hetero. Gene. Glacion. Ala de Hermenia Glasson. Okay. The gifts. Now we're going to get, when we get up to verse 28, we're going to take this little thesis of mine and we're going to start on page 8 and 9. We're not going to go through all this history in there, all the documentation I had to do when I was doing my master's thesis, but we're going to go look at each and every one of these words, and we're going to break it down, what the gifts were, okay? <coughs> and another energizing or operations of powers, dynamis. What kind of powers? What kind of word? That word dynamis there. Dynamite. <laughs> That's where we get a word dynamite from. What kind of a power would this be? Power over death, maybe. Power over someone that's crippled? That Paul raised dead people? Remember that little boy that was uh, uh, up there on the second story and he preached all night long? People used to like long sermons, you know. I'm a weird duck in the world today of 20 minute sermons, you know that? You people are tough. <laughs> that's all I can say, you are tough. Paul was preaching, a little old kid fell, out, fell asleep and fell out of a balcony of a house and killed himself. And what Paul do to him? He said, well, let's have a burial. What did he do? Rebecca? He raised him from the dead. That's powers. Why did he do that? Not for the believers in that church. Not for the boy. The boy had to die anyway. He's going to end up dying sometime or another. What did he do? It? For the non-believers. To prove that they were coming from God. This was coming from God. They didn't have the Bible. Energizing the powers and another prophecy. They didn't have prophecy either. They didn't, all they had, what Bible did they have? The Old Testament. That's what they had. The Scriptures is the Old Testament. That's what it was. The Scriptures of the Old Testament. Prophecy and another judgment. How to judge. When Judas uh, killed himself, what did that church do? What did that church do, that early church? What did they do? They prayed and they cast lots and see who lot who would fall upon. They drew names out of a hat, so to speak, to find out who was going to be the next apostle. Because they thought they had to have 12 apostles. Did God call him one later on? Who replaced Judas? Paul did. Paul replaced Judas. Whether well, that church made a mistake or not. But they were asking God's... In the Old Testament, when they had to make choices or do things, they would draw lots and ask God to do it. They had uh, uh, the breastplate of the, of the high priest that had stones in it. And they would look at that. The priest would look, and they would look, and they would say, should we go this way? If those stones lit up and shined... It was the Spirit of God doing that, and they said, up the scope. That's what he wants us to do. And they would keep on asking questions and praying, asking questions, maybe for days, until the stones lit up. 
Well, now, God has distributed all kinds of gifts, different kinds of languages, different kinds of languages. Heteron, that means different, and Jene means what? Jene means what? What does Jene mean? Genesis. Our word Genesis comes from it. Huh? It means a beginning. Different kinds, different uh, genetic languages. How many languages are there in the world? After the Tower of Babel, there's a whole lot of them. A whole lot of them. I used to remember all this kind of stuff. I think there was 2,898 language groups. In Europe alone, I think there were eight basic language groups, if I remember right, in, in Europe. And uh, in the Middle East, of course, we have Hebrew, and, and we have all kinds of sister languages. That Over here in America, the Hamites had their language confused more than anybody else. Their languages more. They was like 600 and some odd languages in the United States, or in Americas, in the Americas. Over 600 languages here. Some tribes of Indians spoke a masculine and a feminine language in the same tribe. Women spoke one language and the men spoke another. I don't know how they got together. And I think maybe that's what happens anyway, isn't it? <laughs> Different genetic sources of languages. These are known languages. These languages that have a glossary. Our word glossary comes from the word glossol. And uh, King James has said unknown language, that unknown is not there. When, uh, <coughs> when they went into an area, if they didn't know the language, when they got up and spoke, somebody in that church or some missionary from that church would have the ability to speak in the language of those people. And somebody would also have the ability to interpret that language and teach to those people. Different kinds of languages. And to another, hermeneia, hermeneutics. That comes from hermes, hermes, hermeneutics. Understanding those languages, interpreting those languages. All right? Uh, 1 Corinthians uh, 12, 28 through 30, 11 and 14, 13, 2 and 8, 14, 26 through 29, Galatians 3 and 5, 1 John 4 and 1, and Mark, the 16th chapter, and where it actually quotes this here in Mark. Let's go to Mark, the 16th chapter, just for a moment. We're going to play that little game for just a moment. Let's look at it. It's not really scripture. But we're going to put it there. We're, I'm doing the Gospel of Mark on Sunday morning. And we're in uh, chapter 10 right now, I think. <clears throat> Mark, the 16th chapter. That's the end of the book. Now, from down to verse number 8, that's the end of Mark. There's no, nothing else. That's where the, work, the book of Mark ends is, is verse number 8. All right. And they were, went out quickly and fled from the sepulcher, and for they were trembled and were amazed, and uh, neither said they anything to one another, for they were afraid. And then verse 9 goes on. Now that Jesus was risen early on the first day of the week, he appeared to Mary Magdalene, and, uh, and he went and told them that he had been with him, and they mourned and wept. And uh, verse number 11. And... When they had heard that he was alive and had seen her and believed not. After that he appeared to another, in another form unto two of them as they walked and went into the country. And they went and told it unto the residue. That's just King James I'm reading from, by the way. And neither believed they them. Verse number 14. Afterward he appeared unto the eleven, as they sat at meat, and upbraided them for their unbelief and the hardness of their heart, because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. Now, the Gospel of Mark actually ends over there in verse number eight or nine, okay? 
We're going to find out that in the Greek language, you can tell that there was a different writer that wrote the first part of the Gospel of Mark and what's doing the ending here. He puts things in here that are, there are some things in here that are really weird. Okay? He's taken compilations of other uh, works, and this was put in here several hundred A.D., by the way. It wasn't go back, because the Gospel of Mark was one of the earliest Gospels written. It was written before A.D. 70, before the temple was destroyed. They found pieces of the Gospel of Mark at the Dead Sea Scroll, at the Qumran Caves. Did you know it, Brother Dick? They found pieces of it. And they know it was very old. <coughs> That was before A.D. 7, so we know it was before A.D. 70. Now let's see what it says here. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach to every creature. Okay? Now in Matthew 28, 18 through 20, it doesn't say creature, does it? Now here's where people go out in different churches and they start preaching to the birds and the bees and the squirrels. Because they think the creatures, the creatures already believe people. <laughs> they already know there's a God. They haven't been told in school that there is no God. Okay? <clears throat> and he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. But he that believeth not shall be damned. Now the church of Christ, brethren, they use this scripture right here and say he that believeth and is baptized. This is the only place that says that in the scripture. All right? This is the only place that says that in the scripture. But probably <coughs> this was written after baptism or regeneration began. You go back and study the, the history of manuscripts, and you're going to see little bits and pieces put in here that are from late, much later writing. And this is one of the crazy people that handle snakes, too. Well, yes, but we're getting there, Bill. <coughs> to hold off. He that believeth is and baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. There's your Church of Christ deal there, and also your Jesus only. They use this same thing. And these signs shall follow them that believe. Now, this here is totally out of the context of the whole shooting match. They will cast out devils. Now, they did do this. The early church did this. This was written most assuredly after the whole New Testament was written, and the book of Acts has talked about this. All right? Or who was bit in the Bible by a snake, and he just shook it off into the fire? Paul the Apostle. There are people today that handle snakes. The snake handling church. Okay? And they shall speak with new languages, in new languages. Alright? That's not what we're talking about. We're not talking about a new, different language other than what were known languages among those people. And they shall take up serpents. Alright? And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. Some of the early church members would find out were trying to be, they tried to poison them, didn't they? All right. Poisoning was a real, they used arsenic back then too. I don't know who slipped arsenic to me and mer mercury, but somebody did, pulled an old trick. But it didn't work. <laughs> I guess it was the power of God that brought me through all of it. I'm sure it was. But I can't claim this verse for it. <laughs> he wasn't finished with me yet. And they shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Now, they did that. Soon after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat at the right hand of God. And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs. Now, that's real good, confirming the word with signs, because that's what it did. They got that one right, even though it was written much many years later. Okay? <laughs> these languages are known languages these are not some mystical language alright 12 and verse 11 now well we're there we're, it's 7 o'clock <laughs> you want this verse or you want to go you want this one alright 12 and verse 11 Ponta de Tauta Energe To Hen or N that is Kai To Auto Numa Diaron, Idio, Hecosto, Kathos, Bulete. And all of these things energizing the one and the same spirit spreading throughout and distributing 
to one in one's own to each just as he wishes. All right? Who wishes? The Spirit of God. Rebecca, can you run up here real quick and read up to verse number 11 for us? <coughs> We got through that subject anyway. Now we're going to go into another subject next week. All right. Five, six through uh, 11. And there are distinctive varieties of operation of working to accomplish things, but it is the same God who inspires and energizes them all in all. But to each one is given the manifestation of the Holy Spirit, the evidence, the spiritual illumination of the Spirit for good and profit. To one is given in and through the Holy Spirit the power to speak a message of wisdom, and to another the power to express a word of knowledge and understanding according to the same Holy Spirit. To another, wonder-working faith by the same Holy Spirit. To another, the extraordinary powers of healing in the one Spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophetic insight, the gift of interpreting the divine will and purpose. To another, the ability to discern and distinguish between the utterances of true spirits and false ones. To another, various kinds of unknown tongues. And to another, the ability to interpret such tongues. All these gifts, achievements, abilities are inspired and brought to pass by one and the same Holy Spirit, who apportions it to each person individually exactly as he chooses. Thank you very much. <coughs> They got the unknown in there, but it's not unknown. Did you see unknown anywhere? <laughs> Agnosis. Agnosis means ignorant or unknown. Okay, it's not there. All right. But the language is that they did not know when they came into contact with these people, they would be able to speak in that language and they would be able to preach in that language. All right, 12 and 12 is where we'll start. Do you have any questions? I won't turn you loose if you if you got a question. All right. So we want 12, 5, 5 through 11. All right, 12, 5 through 11. Keep your little booklets and uh, read uh, page 8 and 9 and 23 and 26. And I want you to, uh, this is a test too, by the way. <laughs> Not really. But read through those things and look at the words for the gifts. Look at the words that these gifts are. The gifts of languages, the gifts of uh, healing, all of the different what gifts, okay? Uh, page 8 and 9 and 23 and 26. That ought to keep you busy until next week. We'll go through all of this. That's why I handed this little booklet out to you. We'll go through the whole thing. You don't read to have to read the whole thing. I did that because they wanted me to do a lot of research when I did that. I had to have a I think a 20,000 word thesis, my doctor's thesis had to be 50,000 words. And I'm j by the way, I'm applying for another doctorate. <laughs> Might be the third one. <laughs> anyway, for the book of, of uh, Genesis, the doctor of Bible languages for another, from another seminary. Anyway, uh, it's good to have all of you here today. And uh, happy Valentine's to all of you tomorrow and that you have a real good day. I hope that you learned something from God's Word tonight. We're not finished with these. Uh, the 12th chapter is very, very important. And the 13th and the 14th and the 15th and the 16th, you know, all the way through, every chapter, every, every verse in these uh, scriptures is God-breathed, isn't it? Every bit of it is God-breathed. I believe in the inspiration of the Bible. I don't believe in any other uh, prophet of Mohammed, or uh, Charles Taze Russell, or Joseph Smith, or Buddha, or anybody else, not even Crazy Horse. <laughs> but I believe the scriptures that they are inspired, and they are our complete rule of faith and practice. We need to judge our feelings by the scriptures, not the scriptures by our feelings, or what we think. It's so hard to get somebody out of a false religion or maybe they're almost true, but they won't leave things because why? That's what mama and daddy and grandma and grandpa. Have you ever seen how hard it is to convert a Catholic or a Mormon? Boy, they're just pretty much 86 out of their whole families when they are. It's hard to get people to turn loose of that. But if you're going to believe in God, 
believe in God rightly, correctly. All right, believe in God correctly. Good to have all of you here. Who wants to dismiss us in prayer tonight? All right, Michelle won't come up here. And you're dressed up really pretty tonight. <laughs> Uh, Brother Dick, you've been off on vacation. You've been AWOL for a long time. How about coming up here and dismiss us in prayer, brother? <coughs> we, we missed you. <coughs> Father, we thank you for this time looking at your word. We thank you for Brother Jim and for his insights and the ability to convey those truths to us. And uh, we just pray and continue to pray for his health. We thank you again, as he has for every one of us who is here tonight. We pray that you would uh, help us as we go our various ways to have safety and to be willing to share the things that you've brought into our hearts and lives through Jesus Christ. We pray in his name. Amen. Amen. Now, I know that none of you have the gift of healing, but I sure would have covet your prayers. I have been sick all day today uh, with my stomach. And uh, I need your prayers. I made it. I didn't think I was going to make it tonight at all. I just, all day long, I said, boy, I hope I can get up there and preach. And, uh, and that's what I worry about more than anything, just get, being able to get up here and deliver. <laughs> and the Lord answered my prayers and your prayers, too. God bless you. You look pretty good,